what you can do when you mix 3D printing with 3D embroidery. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to my weekly vlog for March 29th, 2021. This is vlog number 210, and it is now 383 days. I was going to say of COVID isolation, but I think I'm going to change that now to before I've gotten a vaccine or something like that. I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't even be counting anymore. But yeah, it's hard to believe we're just over a year now in this thing really okay so let's uh, get right into what we're going to talk about today and behind me you can see that I have got a quilt now this is not done yet this I just got started on and it is a fusion of one design which came from a pattern which is the center part which is called a carpenter circle and then I am now uh, changing that pattern to create what you see in front of you and I think it's turning out quite nice now I think what I'm going to do next is put some wide borders in this color scheme that you see here I have to look through my stash and see what I have and then that will be the first layer done the top of the quilt will be done and then from there I will layer it and I will quilt it and I'll show you what it looks like when it's done but right now I think it's looking darn good so I'm quite pleased with myself. I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about what I mean by sort of a fusion quilt, my term, nobody else's, um, tomorrow on the next episode of The Idiot Quilter. So if you're interested, um, stay tuned for that tomorrow. Okay, so that and of course I did show at the very beginning my little 3D printed bunnies with my uh, freestanding uh, lace and applique umbrellas and I'm using the one with the fabric as a candy dish. I put a bunch of those little miniature eggs in them. And those little miniature eggs are kind of bad. I got them on sale at Shoppers Drug Mart and they're very waxy. Which figures. Um, but the other thing that I have there with the bunny sitting under it is this. This is a freestanding lace umbrella. The same design except the difference between it and the freestanding applique one is um, that this doesn't have any fabric in it. It is all embroidery thread and actually out of the two of them I like this one better um, in fact I'm finding this one is a little bit uh, stiffer than the other one uh, with the fabric even though they both used water soluble stabilizer but I think this one turned out really really cute so right now as you saw in the teaser I'm using them as sort of a little Easter display on an end table in my family room so what else have I been making well speaking of of uh, freestanding applique I've created this truck and there are bales of hay in the back and these bales of hay are 3d printed because it needed something in the back now I'm not overly thrilled with the end result a little piece of glue on that uh, with this truck it looks okay but if you see it in real life it's a little lopsided there are gaps in it and um, it would have been nice if they put in something like a little windshield in here you know they could have designed a part that you could have done just like the windows on the side of the truck but they didn't also they did not design this in the way that usually these things are designed for putting them together if you look on this umbrella you can see there's these little knobs hanging out around it well those are called buttonettes and they go through little eyelets and that's what holds the whole thing together I add a little drop of glue on the end of each one of them so that they'll stay secure. This one didn't have anything like that. In fact, what they wanted you to do with this one was to hand sew it together. Now, when you have all of this layer of embroidery thread on something, it is really tough getting a needle through it. And I couldn't use the machine because of the way, like it has this bottom section, I'm trying to do this without dumping out my bales of hay that you know are not attached to the wheel part they go around so they did also say you could do it with glue so I got out my glue gun and uh, away I went now you know with glue gun you get a lot of strings and things like that usually and so this got a little messy and you could see some of the glue between my seams in here 
Uh, you don't really notice it right now, but there's a reason why you don't notice it there. You can see a little bit more. It's because I went over it with a fabric, a red fabric marker, so it wouldn't be so prominent. So, you know, having done all those little extra things to get this together, um, didn't impress me much. Um, I've had this pattern for quite a while. Um, I don't know why, probably it was on sale when I bought it and, you know, at that time it struck my fancy. Um, but yeah, it's done now. So it's okay. It's okay. And, you know, I guess you can't expect everything to come out perfect every time. Um, if I was to do it again, and I'm not going to, um, I think I would figure out a way that I could sew the pieces together with my sewing machine because I just know hand sewing it, it would be even more of a mess than gluing it. But for now, with the little bales of hay all piled up here in the back, and thank you to those people yesterday who recommended I just stuff it with some fabric scraps to build the hay up, that worked really well. So yeah, I'm kind of pleased with my little bales of hay. Okay, so that takes us to the channel of the week, speaking of crafting, and you know I told you uh, last week that um, I am going through some male uh, crafters right now that were in sort of a, well not sort of, it was a YouTube uh, vlog hop, craft hop, whatever you want to call it. And these were all working together on various projects but you went from one to the other. So I discovered some new and very interesting crafters. They're all male and I thought each week for a little while I will feature one of them. So today is Chemo Crafts. Today's YouTube video of the week is by a crafter who was part of the men's crafting hop that uh, I told you about last week with the Crafty Lumberjacks. And I have discovered about five different uh, guys who do DIYs and crafting that I did not know anything about before. So I thought I would explore their YouTube channels. And one of those is called Chemo Craft, and I believe he's located in Hawaii. Maybe, I'm not sure, but he opens up his video by saying aloha. So I'm assuming he's in Hawaii. But nevertheless, he has a lot of really interesting and cute DIY projects and craft things. He also does a, a Dollar Tree DIY as well. Now there's a lot of these on YouTube showing you how to take cheap things and make them into other items for home decor for the seasons uh, but he does his with a bit of a flair and he has a nice variety of different kinds of DIYs. Some of them are geared towards children, others, others of them are geared towards really serious home decor. So if you're looking for ideas for freshening up your home, uh, bringing it up to uh, a new level, then you might want to watch his videos because he does all of this on a budget. So check out Chemo Craft. So the link to Chemo Crafts is in the show notes below. There's the link to this week's Stephen and Walter Live. Um, last week on the vlog I mentioned that we tend to get a little carried away with talking all about um, sewing. And that's not the intent of Stephen and Walter Live. That's why I have the idiot quilter. So yes there is overlap through all uh, across all my segments, channels, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and I did try to veer away from talking about uh, sewing a little bit. Don't know how successful we were. Uh, I did get into a little bit of a rant about uh, not being able to get the shot yet because of my age group has, it doesn't qualify for it. And I think I said some things that maybe rub some people the wrong way about religion um, and that and I do apologize for that but I get very passionate about some of these things as most of you that are regular viewers know um, so please excuse the rant that I went on that had anything to do with religion okay um, so the link for that is down below and there is a link to the idiot quilter from last week but there is another link for a new sort of channel, part of our channel, but a new area of our channel uh, that we call So Chatty. And that has to do about sewing, but a little bit different from the Idiot Quilter. I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, later on in today's vlog. But let's take me to what's pissing me off this week. Now, 
I kind of started on this yesterday in uh, Stephen and Walter Live, and I want to clarify a few things about how I'm feeling right now about getting the shot. Okay. Walter and I are in the in the age bracket that falls the way our government's doing it in our province to the 60 to 64 year old. Now, if we really feel like we're being left out of it all. Yes, they prioritized 80 and up got the shot first and anyone in a long-term care facility got the shot first. That is fine. I have no problem with that whatsoever. It makes absolutely sense sense absolute sense is what I'm trying to say because they're a very vulnerable group. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. Then their their next tier or whatever or part of this, it's very difficult. It's been very, very confusing. You go onto the net and you take a look at how they're doing this and you can find three different methods. Um, none of them see to co seem to coincide. They change the rules every day here. Um, someone said yesterday on our vlog and you know, I could have got offended by it, but I'm not offended by it because they're absolutely right. They said the Canadian government has handled this thing very shitty. Yes, absolutely right. Our government has. I don't know if that's unique to any government in the world in the way they're handling it, handling it. But right now, this is the country I live in. They're the people that are making up the rules and they're doing a shitty job of it. Um, so anyways, then they have a whole list of who is going to get the shot next. If you're an Indigenous person, you're going to get the shot no matter what your age is. I talked about that yesterday. Again, I'm sorry, I wasn't being very politically correct about that. Okay. Then they talk about, you know, frontline workers. Well, that I don't have a problem with that at all either. Anybody in a hospital setting, anybody in healthcare where you're going to come into contact with sick people, yes, for sure, they have to have the shot. I'm fine with that. But in my age group, now what they're doing is, of course, we've got the three vaccines, fourth with the Johnson & Johnson. We don't, I don't know if we're getting any of the Johnson & Johnson in Canada yet. I don't know if we have a deal with them or not. But um, we have the three shots. Of course, the third shot that came out uh, is the one that supposedly is least effective. But whatever that means, we're not sure. Because again, you hear multiple reports from it all. It, it comes down to, I guess, any shot's a good shot is what they're trying to put out to us. Okay, fine. I don't have a problem getting that shot. I'm not picking. If, if time comes up, I'll take whatever's available. Okay, that's fine. But this is the problem, the availability of it. So they're saying if you're in the 60 to 64 uh, age group, you'll be able to go to a drugstore, like a shopper's drug mart, and be able to um, get the shot from a pharmacist. You just need to phone up and make an appointment. Yeah, no. Those are only happening in some of the major centers in my province right now. Toronto, of course, okay? Toronto's getting everything first. Well, yeah, they've had the most cases out of the whole of Ontario. It's been concentrated more in Toronto than anywhere else, but then that is logical, isn't it? Because Toronto has, you know, a population, Metro Toronto or whatever they call it these days, has, you know, over th 3 million people or something or up. Uh, depends on whether you take in the suburbs or not into all that number. But anyways, yeah, a lot of people in a smaller area concentrated living in a city. Yes. Okay. So I get that. But out here where we are in Durham region, which is only 40 minutes from Toronto, okay? Um, nothing, nothing for us. We can't go to a shopper's drug mart because they don't have it to get that shot. So what's happening is this. There are people that I know in our area, they are people that I social associate with, have gotten the shot. Some of them are slightly younger than me. They've gotten the shot because they went to Toronto to get it, to one of the burbs of Toronto. Called up, got an appointment, went in, got their shot. Some people are traveling to another area that has this available. That's Kingston. Kingston is two hours away from me. 
Um, I have a problem with that because these people don't live in those areas. The reason those areas, according to what the government said, that we're getting this the third vaccine to give it to people between 60 and 64 was because those areas are cities. They're hot spots. That's what they call them. They're hot spots. So, okay, but people are driving into these areas that don't live in those areas to get the shot and they're getting it. They're supposed to check your ID to check where you're, where you're living. Well, I don't think they did because the people I know that got the shot that, wasn't in our, that aren't in our area, that live in our area but went out of our area is what I mean, obviously they got the shot and no one asked them where they lived or checked any kind of proof of residency. So great. So people like me and Walter who are... Uh, following the rules, even though the rules keep changing on a pretty much daily basis, we're left in the dust. Yeah, we're just left in the dust. But you know, that's the way this whole COVID thing has happened for people like Walter and I. All the financial stimulus too, you've heard me talk about this before, all the financial stimulus had went to people that were not us. Why didn't we get any? Well, okay, we are retired. We have pensions. So we have an income that basically is not affected. Oh, that's great. Sorry about that. I just went for a fall. Not me. My iPad. Okay, let's hope that holds it there. Okay, back to it. We don't qualify for any financial stimulus because, as I said, we have pensions. Great. That's a good thing. Okay, we're not hurting uh, financially because we're not a business. So we're not hurting for that. We don't have children in the education system. We don't have children, period. So we get nothing from that to help out with daycare or whatever. And for, you know, at home schooling and that kind of thing. Um, we're not identified as being in a group that has certain disabilities or health concerns or live in certain ethnic communities that are you know less privileged i guess so we qualify for nothing there all right i'm fine with that until tax time comes not this year but down the road our taxes are going to go up obviously because the government's been spending money on this whole thing you know fist over fist where's that money come from us so we already fall into one of the higher tax brackets not because of how much money we make in our pension, because we don't make a lot of money on that, but it's because we don't have anybody to write off. We don't have any dependents. We do not. We are not caregivers. Uh, we do not have any disabilities. Uh, nothing like that. We're just normal, healthy people. Okay, should be thankful for that. I am. I'm thankful for that. But how is this relating to the shot? It's just again we're being put on the back burner. Now, that's not good because as people get the shots, there is a false sense of security with the shot. We have to remember the vaccine is not a cure. It's immunization. You can still get COVID and you may not have it as severe as some people that don't have the shot uh, will get it. Uh, but you can still get it. That means it's still catchable. It's still spreadable out there. Um, the I have not heard. I'm confused. Somebody mentioned this the other day on Stephen and Walter Live. Once you've had the shot, even if you're asymptomatic or something, but you've had the shot, you can't transmit it to anybody else. I'm not sure how that works. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but I could be wrong. I'm not a medical professional. Um, the whole thing is, you feel like a second-class citizen. So, how many of us in my age bracket, because of these things our government has done, are going to get COVID, and how many of them are going to die? I don't want to die. But also, I want to be a good citizen and play by the rules, too. It's not all about me. It's about us. And people keep saying the more people get these shots and now they've extended, they're saying, well, you know, the second shot, 
uh, you probably don't need you probably don't even need a second shot now they're saying one will be enough uh, down the road you can get a second shot that'll act like a booster it was three weeks between shots originally now they're saying it's four months and this way they'll have more vaccine to go around quicker okay I see that logic but is that really true do they really know I don't know and I don't trust them I don't I'm sorry I don't trust them because they keep changing the rules and it's not because necessarily that they're trying to pull the wool over our eyes it's because they don't know themselves for sure I mean it's been a year it's just been a year they have developed at a remarkable speed a vaccine for this okay great that's faster than usually vaccines get developed however in that speed they haven't been able to thoroughly long-term test it obviously so we don't know we don't know that does not mean that I would not get the shot okay I will still get the shot for sure but they're saying now well you know if 75 percent or 80 percent of the population has been vaccinated then they have something called herd immunity just like this little magic umbrella of protection because of the number I'm not an immunize, 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 you know, person who, who knows all about uh, infectious disease. Um, so I'm not sure about that. But, you know, I equate that to when they were talking about staying in your bubble. And that was interpreted in many different ways by many different people. And the bottom line is that's just a term. It didn't do anything at all. Um, maybe because people weren't following the rules with that. Maybe. I just don't know about this herd immunity kind of thing. Um, you know, supposedly we don't have smallpox anymore in the world. It was eradicated. Well, it's not. There is smallpox in the world. In fact, just a couple of years ago, um, in certain parts of the world, smallpox was making a uh, resurgence um, or reemergence, emergence, surgence. It was coming back up. Rented lips, rented brain, I don't know. Um, so it's still around. And although we've all had the shots for that and everything, you know, as kids and whatnot. In fact, I don't even know if they give you a shot for that anymore because of the herd thing. Um, it's still out there. So it hasn't gone away. So I don't know. I, I don't know what to think. I'm not... A doctor I'm not someone in the medical pr profession but I guess it's just feeling like you're being put on the back burner right now and and not really being given a lot of justification it, it's kind of like okay going to the shoppers drug mart to get the third vaccine they've come out with which is less effective let's practice that one let's use those people in that age bracket Let, let's use them as guinea pigs that's what it feels like but then again I suppose we are all guinea pigs in this whole situation well we wait and we see that's all we can do yep okay so that takes me to product review I do have one new thing to show you it's exciting are you ready yes I bought a new glue gun yay <laughs> I bought it from Amazon my other glue gun I have several glue guns but the one I use most of the time just stopped working so it's toast it's garbage i mean i had a long time i got my money's worth out of it so i bought this it was not terribly expensive i do kind of like the fact that it has this little stand on it um the only thing that's not so good is you got to get used to using it with the stand on it but that works too but you can slide the stand off although it's a little bit difficult it does have an on off switch which is kind of nice my other one didn't it uses your standard glue sticks and um it seems to work okay it's got this little rubber tip on the end that uh, goes around the nozzle part and i don't know what the whole point of that's for that comes off it came with two tips um a little wider one and a little thinner one and uh yeah i thought this might be to help prevent stringing mm, no it doesn't still get a lot of strings i don't know if you get the strings because of the type of glue or the way this these things work i don't know um maybe somebody out there knows of a glue stick you can get that's going to be stringless i don't know if there is such a thing um not that that's a big problem it's just it's 
It's kind of annoying, isn't it? When you're doing a craft, you have all these stupid strings. Although I did find uh, a way to uh, uh, limit the st strings on something. Like after you're done gluing it, take your hot air gun, um, you know, the kind of thing you use with crafting, and just blow it around and the little strings just sort of disappear. So there's something. Okay, so anyways, that's about the only thing new I bought, but I've got a ton of fabric on order. I've ordered fabric from Peach Tree Quilts. If you watch The Idiot Quilter, you know who they are. I ordered some fabric from Runaway Quilts. Both of those places are Canadian. And I ordered some of my own fabric that I had designed back when I first got into quilting. And you've seen it in some of my quilts. And I, I did it through spoon flour. And if you're not familiar with spoon flour, basically they'll take whatever you want to give them and they'll print it for you as fabric or wallpaper or gift wrap, or all this kind of stuff. It's a little bit pricey. Um, well, especially for us in Canada because it's an American company. But it's kind of neat because you get some something that's very unique and personalized yourself. So I ordered four yards can't order in meters it's American I ordered four yards of one of my fabrics just to have it because I got looking at it on the that, that I used on the back of a quilt a long time ago thought yeah I should get more of that so I did but it hasn't come yet when it does I'll show it to you okay so what's that take me to oh yes stories about my grandmother this week's edition it's my grandmother's organ. Okay, wait, 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 wait. When I said organ, I'm not talking about any body parts, okay? I'm talking about an electric organ. You know, kind you play. Now, my grandmother, amongst other things, was a great musician. She could sit down at a piano or at a pump organ, because there used to be a pump organ in the family cottage for years and years, and just play. No music in front of her, just play. She had an amazing talent. She just could play by ear and very elaborately. And lots of people, anytime they'd say to her, hey Daisy, my grandmother's name was Daisy, Daisy, why don't you play us a tune? And she would. But one thing she really wanted was, she didn't own a piano in her house, but in the 60s, she decided to buy an organ, a Lowry. Now, Lowry organs were around for years. They may still be around. I think they still are. But they were famous for making organs that were home organs, domestic organs. That sounds funny to say domestic organ. But, you know, it was meant for home use. And these organs were set up so that they could play, you know, um, different rhythms well the more elaborate ones would play rhythms in the background uh you could alter the sound so it sounded more like a violin yeah you had to use your imagination on that in those days uh that kind of thing but anyways my my grandmother got one of these now she had done there was a room off of her main living room in her house that um might have been referred to as the good living room or the parlor at one point in time. She had been using it when I was very, very small uh, for, I think, one of my great grandparents. I don't know if it was her mother. I barely remember this because this would have been the very late 1950s. And, you know, I was born in 57. So when I said the late 50s, I was like under three years old kind of a thing. Um, I remember some old lady in a bed in there and that set up as a bedroom and my grandmother tending to her and I, she passed away. Um, and when she did, my grandmother, I guess, decided to redo that room and make it all into a very formal living room. And my grandmother was very progressive. So when she redecorated this room, she put in wall-to-wall -wall carpeting because her house did not have wall-to-wall -wall carpeting anywhere in the house at all. This was the very early 60s. Um, so she put that in and it was green. <laughs> yes, the carpet was green. Um, and it was very, I remember you get rug burn on it really easy because it was very tight weave. Um, 
I don't know what they called it in those days. It's not what we have today for carpeting in, in homes. Anyways, it co probably cost her quite a lot of money. She had uh, a sectional couch in there that went around in a curve. I always thought that was really modern, really cool when I was a little kid. It was also uh, green, <laughs> chenille bump kind of a thing. She had a thing for green. She had custom made end tables and a coffee table out of solid wood with and she had glass on the top of them and they were very they were kind of Scandinavian in style um, I'm sure they cost her a lot of money at the time for it in fact I inherited those tables and we were using them until relatively recently in our own house until we redid our family room and I just saw, saw the tables I now have in there and sort of replaced them and uh, we gave those tables to um, Walter's niece because she had just moved into a house but I digress she also had these wonderful lamps in that room I thought they were they were very very modern very stylish for the 1960s they had Blue Mountain bases on them that came out and they were tall and they were cylindrical but they came down like this and I thought those were great and I also inherited those and those lamps were in my first apartment and they were in my house in my first house but actually we replaced those with something a little different in our living room but they were in the basement which in the old house is basically was my work area and it was unfinished so i had some old furniture down there and i had these lamps down there and then when we moved to this house they were in our rec room before we redid it as well so those lamps made the rounds um I'm trying to think where those lamps went now I don't know if we gave them away or they just went to, you know, Value Village or something like that. I think that's where they ended up, Value Village. Anyways, she had put all this money into redoing this room and it was a show place. But the center of attention in this room was her Lowry organ. She paid a lot of money for that organ at the time. I still have somewhere around the house the original bill of sale and I think that organ cost at that time close to two thousand dollars which was a lot of money in the early 60s but she had this and she would play it and my grandmother as i said was an excellent uh musician we as children were all taking piano lessons and we wanted to play on the organ my grandmother had a rule you had to wash your hands before you played the organ and you had to be playing music and she had sheet music there in fact the organ came with a, a little cardboard cutout that fit over the little stops that you would push to make different sounds and you they had things on there telling you if you push this key this key and this key this combination you got an oboe sounding thing Okay. Okay, I'm back. That's one for the blooper reel. Yep, the whole thing just fell right off the desk onto the floor and you got to go with me for that little spill, okay? I could cut that out when I, I do my little bit of editing, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to leave it. So what was I talking about? Okay, the organ. Wash your hands, play music, and that was it. And Thus, we followed my grandmother's rules for that kind of thing. So, when my grandparents passed away and my parents cleaned out their house, they didn't know what to do with this organ. So, I got it. I inherited the organ. And that organ went with me to um, my house. It went to my apartment first. And then my first house, it went with me. And it came to this house that I live in now. And... I no longer have the organ. Now, I did take Royal Conservatory music classes for years. I got up to grade eight. Um, I suck <laughs> at playing anything. Um, I'm really bad. I'm really bad. In fact, I don't think I could play anything now, but I had this keyboard, this organ. And every now and then I would turn it on and play it. Now, the other thing I didn't tell you about the organ was it was half tubes and half what they called solid state, meaning, you know, electronic 
components because it was at that time when when things like this were making the transition from the old vacuum tube system to the you know transistors and resistors and everything like that so that in itself made it a unique piece and the other fact is it still worked and it worked fine probably that's because my grandmother made us wash our hands and not abuse it so this was more than just a musical instrument for me it was something that uh, was a memory of my grandmother and so I kept it for years and years and years even though I would never play it so it's a heavy sucker too Getting it downstairs into our rec room just about killed us. I think it took four men to manhandle it down the stairs. And I always said, we sell the house, we sell the organ with it. Well, I did get rid of the organ. I didn't sell it. Finally got to the point where I got thinking, we're not getting any younger. I'm not playing it. <sighs> Someday it's going to have to be moved out of this house. So... I thought, okay, I'm going to find a new home for it. Now, I did try to sell it, but I looked online as to how much people would pay for it. And really, if you were trying to get more than 50 bucks for it, forget it, which seemed like a bit of a shame. But it was just not in demand. And that particular model of Lowry organ, those were mass produced, so it's not even a collector's item. So I really didn't get anybody interested in it. Plus, I'd put into the ad that you know you had to it was in my basement you had to come prepared to get it out and it weighed about 600 pounds so i did get one inquiry in fact after trying to sell it i said we're best offer then i said free i got one person who was interested in coming to look at it and would take it he was kind of a quirky individual he collected organs. He was going to start up an organ. You know, this sounds really weird. It's an organ. I set up an organ museum. And he would have liked this for his collection. I was a little skeptical about it. I still am. But the guy came equipped. He brought his wife. She was a bit of a bruiser. Um, and uh, they brought a cart uh, to get it up the stairs and the whole bit. And so... He sat down, he tried it out, played it and whatnot. And he said, yeah, sure, he'd take it off our hands. He wanted to know the providence of it. So I told him about what I've just told you about my grandmother. And that organ now has a name. He said, you know, did your grandmother ever have a name for anything? I said, not that I remember, no. And he said, well, what was your grandmother's name? And I said, Daisy. And he says, this organ from this day on will be known as Daisy's organ. So whether or not, this is a couple of years ago, whether or not he ever got around to opening up his museum, in fact, um, I asked him about that because I said, you know, when you open your museum, I would really like you to get in contact with me and let me know because I'd be interested in, you know, going to your museum and seeing Daisy's organ. <laughs> and uh, he said he would let me know. But right now he had, he had quite a few organs in his collection. I forget the number he said, but I thought, wow, that's a lot. Where are you keeping them? He had a storage unit somewhere and that's where they were being stored. So I hope that Daisy's organ went to a good home where it will be preserved for all time and that kind of thing. I don't know. I have a feeling not, but I'm going to believe that it is because, you know, that was really a personal piece of history in my family. And um, yeah, it was hard for me to give it up, but it's time had come. So I hope my grandmother can forgive me for giving her organ away. Okay. This is my grandmother's organ that I was talking to you about. And you can see it's an old uh, Lowry organ, probably built in, well, was built in the early 60s. Uh, at the time, fairly high tech, fairly expensive but no longer do I have it, as you know. So that takes us to the 3D corner, um, making lots of little things as usual. So I, what, what 3D printing of figurines is complete without Rodin's The Thinker? You know, nothing says 3D printing like a naked man on a rock. But yeah, I came out pretty good. I did them in the marble. 
and uh, the details on it are not that fine but that's okay you get the idea um, and where am I putting all these things because I've shown you different things over the weeks well I have created a 3d shelving system made with the 3d printer in order to display these things that I make and I'm going to expand that but I thought you might be interested in seeing that so I'm going to insert a little bit of a video right here that just runs for about 30 seconds showing you what I'm talking about so I'm gonna put that in here right now so this is my 3d corner where I have my 3d printer and uh, actually this was a, another work table and I took it over for the 3d printer and now I'm running out of room for the things that I create so I created these shelves, they're all 3D, the brackets, they call them Victorian corners, Victorian corner brackets, and then I designed, which was just a slab uh, for the top of the shelf, screw nailed it into the wall here, and now I've got some of my 3D creations on display. And as time goes by in this corner, I'll probably add more shelves and clean out some of these other pieces of artwork that are here. I also printed something that's really working out well. We were having trouble on Stephen and Walter Live with, we've been experimenting with different rooms in the house where we can do it uh, because of the lighting situation. And we have settled on doing it in my craft room, which is where I am right now. But we sit in front of the computer to do the live. And I have two monitors, one on top of each other, big monitor up on top. and in order to make it look like we're making eye contact with people, we need to be able to look at the camera straight on. So that means the camera has to be raised. It's a cam, uh, a webcam that we're using. Um, so it's gotta be, you know, kind of at eye level. Well, the problem was there isn't enough space to put a tripod there or whatever to do that. So I had the camera propped up on a box, basically. That was the right height. But then that kind of blocked the screen and we couldn't really see ourselves um, to make sure we're in the shot or, or whatever. So I thought there must be a way around that. So I printed this. What is this? You've seen these probably at Christmas time. This is a wreath hanger. You know, this part goes over top of your door and this part's where the wreath hangs. And this one is made so that it folds up, which I thought is kind of cool. I printed that on the 3D printer all in one piece. And it, when it came off the printer, it looked exactly like this, did exactly this and everything. And so this works great because I hook this over top of the monitor and it hangs down just at the right height. I put the camera in this hook and I just use a binder clip to hold it. Actually, it goes this way, sorry. I hook this over the monitor and the webcam fits in here and I just clip it and it's at the right height. It's perfect for it. So. You know, you can make things that work, that are practical as well. And of course, you saw the little mini uh, bales of hay that I printed for the truck. And you know, if you're into miniatures, like little houses and things like that, there is a ton of stuff that people have developed that are free that you can print off and then paint, uh, you know, for little miniature displays and things like that there really just isn't anything that you can't i'm finding that you can't print with a 3d printer um so speaking of that i'm starting a new crafting series a mixed media series and the end result is this this little rose bowl but this rose bowl has a hidden secret this comes off the top and inside you have a little mini album so i'm going to show you over the next few weeks how I made this. Now this has been made using the 3D printer to print the flowers and the bowl. And the flowers, some of these are silk flowers, but the big ones, they're plastic, but I painted them using paint pouring technique to give them a little bit more life. So I'm gonna show you part one of this series that will eventually take you through how I created that whole item. So I'm blending 3D printing with mixed media. It can be done. So I'll put that video right in here. So I'm embarking on a new project and as usual with my projects I don't know what I'm going to be doing. What I do know is what I've got and what I have 
and the idea I have in my head. My idea is to take all these 3D printed roses and this printed 3D printed bowl and make a little rose bowl, something that you could set in the center of a table. Now, I have a problem. This is my, going to be my center rose, but it's too, the bowl is too deep for this. So, I looked in my stash of things that I keep for, well, actually, for no reason at all. I just keep them because someday, you know, they might come in handy, so you don't want to throw them out. Well, look what I have. These are these clear protective discs that come with uh, spools of CDRs and DVDs and things like that, you know, which none of us use anymore. In fact, new computers today don't even come with a CD uh, or DVD drive in them. But I have a whole bunch of these. And I was thinking, well, how can I build this up so that I have the rose sitting at a certain level where I can glue gun the other ones around it so it kind of looks like, you know, a bowl that's overflowing with rosebuds. So these will work fine. I'm just going to drop them in there. Now, right now they're loose, so I'm going to have to glue them all together. And then you see my big rose is on the top. And my other roses will go around, not like this, but you know, I have them in various sizes and whatnot. And I'll build up my little collection here. And then I've got some little leaves that I may stick in and about in here, along with some big basket of paper flowers of different sizes. So I'm making a bouquet in a bowl. And what I'm doing is I'm using up this little bowl dump everything out right here. This bowl was a 3D print that didn't work. It didn't finish properly. That's why you see it's, it should have been bigger than this. Um, would have been kind of nice too if it had finished. Um, but it didn't. But I don't want to throw it away. So this is what I'm going to do. Now I've dug out some of my metallic paints and I'm thinking I will just lightly brush, maybe with a fan brush, the tips of some of these roses to give them a little bit more realism. I mean, they're just hard plastic, aren't they? Um, that's my idea, and I'll see how this goes. So I've got to get out my glue gun and get it heated up, and then I'll show you what I'm going to do. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm packing these uh, rings up on top of each other, and I'm just putting a little hot glue on each layer, and then putting down one of these discs, and I'm building this up so it'll be high enough. Now, one thing that I've noticed here is, and I want to make sure I keep them straight, is that this is building up, there's kind of gaps in between. And that's okay, but I probably don't need as many as I th thought in here. I'm just going to check it here for height. Well, yeah, I think that might be high enough. Yeah, I think so. So take that back out. I don't need these ones anymore. And now I'm going to set it in this bowl. Now I am thinking, I just had another idea when I was off camera. I'm thinking this could be a hidden album. I, instead of, I was just going to glue this in here, but instead I could use this at, with a, a spot underneath and put a little round album in the bottom, sort of like a little secret treasure grove. Or it could be, you know, a little secret hiding place for like keys or something like that. So I'm not going to glue it in here, in the bowl. That was my original idea. But I don't like this color. So I need to paint this. And I'll get out my acrylic paints here. And I've got one that's sort of a coppery color. Let's get this out of our way. And I find a brush. My brushes are in terrible shape. That's because I don't look after them. And let's just see what happens. Yeah, this will work. And this is kind of close to the color I already have on the bowl. So we'll just put this around. This might take two coats. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think I'm going to need two coats because it is sticking, but 
I think it would be better with two coats. Well, yeah, no, I think so. I think I got to go for two coats on this. So, um, should I paint the sides? Yeah, I can paint the sides. I'm trying to get in here to see it. I mean, this doesn't have to be perfect, but give more or less the illusion that this is all one piece. Okay, I'm going to let that dry and then I'll put a second coat on it and then I'll show you what I'm going to do after that. Okay, so I've got my discs painted now and they don't look too bad. Um, they're going to be mainly covered up with the roses and so I'm just setting that aside to dry a little bit longer. But now I have this problem with these plasticky roses. I mean, they look okay, but they're plastic looking. And I'm wondering if I add other colors to them that they'll give it more of a variegated effect. Now, I do have in my metallic paints um, something here that looks sort of like a rose gold, between a rose gold and a bronzy color. So I'm going to take some out. Of, I've stirred it up. I'm just going to take out a little bit of it. And um, I have one of these brushes, and I'm just going to kind of dip it in here, and I'm just going to wisp it along the rows, just to give it, oops, as it bounces, <laughs> just to give it a, a little bit of dimension, and do it on the tips. I think I'm going to need to take out more paint. I really don't know what I'm doing here. Can you tell? Now I'm not really sure if I'm liking this. Um, so what I think I'll do is, let's see, if I take a dry brush, if I find one that's not completely dried up, I want something that's a little bit on the soft side, this one might do, and just sort of dry brush this along here. I think I'm getting more on my hands than I am on the flower. So, I'm not really sure. Well, I've toned down the pinky color of it again, but I don't know if that's really the effect I was going for, although it doesn't look too bad. I was trying to make it a little bit streakier, but maybe I should stop while I'm ahead. Or I could add another color. How about a little bit of, um, maybe a little touch of white. Now I don't have any white metallic, um, but I could use just some regular acrylic or maybe some fluid acrylic. Or here's something I have in my stash. These are paints that I bought a whole bunch of these, and I have never really used them. Well, these are dilution paints. Okay, they're not what I was thinking I have, but yeah, it's white. So go with what's here. Oh, the dilutions haven't all dried up yet. 
Um, clean brush? No? Okay, let's just... Same thing, I'm just adding... I don't know if you can see this. Okay, I need another dry brush. Ooh, that was quite a bit of paint right there. Not what I'm really going for. Okay. Now maybe see what other colors. Yellow, orangey. Okay. It's a little orangey color here. Maybe along the base. Ooh. Maybe not. There you go. That's what usually happens with Delusions paints. They dry up. That one's never been used. Say goodbye. Um, I'm just looking in my collection here. pinky color. These were the paints I was looking for. They're iCraft chalk paints. Oh, that one looks like it's dried up too. It might be a little. I don't know if I add water to it. Yeah, this is what happens to these paints. Let's see what will happen if I add a little water. the camera shot for this. I am not an artist. Can you tell? <laughs> I'm pretty sure you can. Do I know what I'm doing? Nope. Haven't got a clue. I'm just trying to give it a bit of a mottled look to sort of hide the fact that these are plastic, but I don't know if I'm doing it very well. I'm just playing. Okay. Well, that's a little better. Actually, I think that might work. Okay. So, I'm going to take the other ones, and I'm going to do a similar process using other colors. And uh, I'll see what happens, and I'll show you the results. Okay, so I have all my roses painted, such as they are. They don't look too bad. They still look a little fake, but they are fake. So there you go. But they're colorful. And I'm just going to let them sit and dry for a while. And then I'll come back and start arranging them on the on the top of this uh, and putting them down with the glue gun. So next week, part two. Okay, that takes us to events in the past week. Update on my mother. She's fine, I guess. I didn't talk to her last week. Um, I mentioned this on Stephen and Walter Live yesterday. Uh, I got a call, FaceTime call, from one of the staff members at the time when I was should have hooked up with my mother. And uh, they said uh, that she was in bed. And of course, when I hear that, I go, oh, she's not feeling well? I said, oh, no, no, she's just feeling tired. And so we just thought we'd let her sleep. Okay. It's more or less that my mother didn't wasn't in the mood to talk to me on FaceTime, and so that's what she did as an excuse. She's done this before, and that's fine. Um, you may think this is cr 
cruel, but I don't try to get a hold of her later in the week. I wait until the next week. And one reason I do that is because I know she's fine and everything, but there's nothing to talk to my mother about because it's all one-sided, kind of like doing one of these. Um, all I do is blab at her because when I ask her what's new or anything, she's oh same old, same old, nothing new here. So, you know, I, I mean... Maybe some people think that's nasty of me that I let a week go by. But, you know, a lot of people don't even see the people that are their relatives that are in a nursing home, long term care facility, except maybe twice a year, Christmas and at Easter or something like that. Um, at least I try to contact my mother every week. So if we miss one week, it's not the end of the world. Um, so Walter's been cooking again and here's the latest episode of Wally Cooks. Wally just doesn't cook main dishes but he also does hors d'oeuvres. So tonight is hors d'oeuvre Friday and we have pigs in a blanket and we have what are these? They're uh, mozzarella balls. Mozzarella balls made from scratch. Yes all very low fat, very diet, but you do see that. We do yeah, have crudités as well. Take a look What's up. Oh, yeah, there they are. Ooh, very puffy and. Actually, they're not as, as runny as they were last time I made them, but. Oh. Well, my God, they're not runny. What are we going to do now? Anyways, bon appetit. And what else has been going on this week? Um, so, we had a sew day on Saturday with the Canadian male quilters. The group on Facebook that I belong to there was only six of us there at the height of it um, and that's okay uh, that's where I work primarily on that which I always like those sew days because that's I get a lot of sewing done when you know we have that kind of thing and they're nice and social and so that was good and um, oh yeah I did something now you may laugh at me for this I've had the same profile picture on my social media and YouTube for quite a few years. And that picture is really not realistic. I wish it was. Um, that picture was taken almost 20 years ago. It was taken on one of the cruises we were on. It was a gay cruise. And um, they had stations set up all over the ship one night. You know how, on, if you've ever been on a cruise, they do, you know, they do this, they take pictures all the time. And it was basically done in a lot of fun because you posed, they had us posed. And one of those shots where Walter and I are like laying on the floor with our arms up kind of thing. And uh, oh, there was a lot of cheesecakey shots and that. But that one particular picture, I always liked because I take a, lot, a lousy picture. I really do. There's usually something hanging out of my face or nose or mouth or my mouth is screwed up or my eyes are half crooked or whatever. So I always like that picture and I've used it on my social media profiles for years. But you know, it's a bit of a lie. I don't look like that anymore. I have aged in that time. So there is a new picture on my profile and you'll see it on YouTube as well. And it's a bit of a goofy picture because the look on my face, but it does have my beard. And I think I got that picture. I took that picture just after I'd gotten my hair cut after about four months without having it cut uh, kind of a thing. So my hairdresser always likes to give me this peak when she does my hair, this thing that goes up like this. So I put it on there, you know, it's a bit goofy, but it is more realistic. You know, lots of people put up pictures that were taken in the past or glamour shots and really you meet them in real life and go, whoa, you don't look like the same person. And I think that sometimes suggests something about their personalities too. So I thought, hmm, I don't want people to think that of me. You know, so new profile picture. Wow. Okay, what's coming up? I have an art journal class coming up this Sunday and you'll hear more about it on Stephen and Walter Live. It's the thing that I do once a month with my group of ladies uh, and it's always, it's one that I do record, it's a Zoom and I do post it because every month there's all kinds of creative ideas in there for crafters. And speaking of creating, uh, we're coming up close to the first Wednesday of the month. It's not this week, it's next week. And that means craft and chat, a little drop-in session where you can work on whatever you're working on. Um, and 
from about 1 o'clock in the afternoon Eastern Standard Time to about 4 o'clock uh, in the afternoon. All are welcome. I will put in next week's vlog notes and next week's Idiot Quilter and everything and probably in Stephen and Walter Live on Sunday uh, a link to that. You don't need to register you just show up if you're interested and you don't have to show up right at one o'clock you can come in you know anytime between one and four whatever and you know just have some relaxing time working on one of your crafts so that's craft and chat and that will be a week from this wednesday i think the date is april the 7th i believe and what else is coming up well easter of course um not that that's anything really that special to me um and uh but i know for some people it is uh, a little bit of a danger this year the in our area the churches have been pushing the government to allow them to basically fill their churches with people to worship for easter sunday because easter sunday is the most significant you know day in the christian calendar um i don't agree with them doing that and that's what i was trying to get across yesterday when i think i said some things that may offend it some people of certain religious uh you know beliefs um i didn't mean to uh but you know like i really think it, it if you miss easter going to church this year god will forgive you for that given the situation we're under um yes we had the same thing last year um but you know, I can tell you right now for sure our numbers are going to go up after Easter weekend. Because not only will people be going to church one way or another, but they're going to be having family gatherings. And it's going to be Christmas all over again, the whole bit. So our numbers are up. We're in the third wave. Welcome to the fourth wave. Whatever. But, okay, let's not dwell on that right now. Anyways, it's Easter next weekend. Yay. Eat a bunny save a chicken i don't know <laughs> something like that okay so final note i mentioned this earlier in the show but i'll tell you a little bit more we've started a new channel it's not really a new channel it's still under the umbrella of, of bland designs and the idiot quilter channel but it's a new area it's called so chatty s-e-w we did our first episode walter and i we do this one together um the other day and it's been posted and we've been getting a very positive response on the first one and what the whole idea between uh, in so chatty is we're going to talk about uh beginner sewing machines sewing things parts equipment threads whatever from our own personal experience what we have learned in our journey as sewers as my journey as a quilter walter's journey as a garment sewer and we don't pretend that we're experts because we're not but we have learned some things along the way that we wish we had known when we first got into doing this and so each week when we do this it's going to become weekly at least that's our plans right now we're going to talk about these various things we're also going to show people different things like how to clean your machine we're going to talk about various machines because god only knows we've got a house full of sewing machines and we're going to talk about fabrics and we're going to talk about threads choices we're going to talk about the feet for your sewing machine what do you do with them all that kind of stuff so we've done our first episode and our first episode was about buying a sewing, sewing machine like being a rank beginner buying a uh, sewing machine and that is all based on our personal experiences and what we have learned so you might want to check out the first episode to see if this is something you might be interested in and we're looking for comments and suggestions for future episodes of so chatty as well uh, we've already got a few people have given us some ideas like one of those is what i just said about talking about our specific machines uh, someone else suggested they'd like a tour of our sewing areas um, and we can do that for sure um, but anything else now there may be some things people will ask us about that we won't have a clue about and we will we will not bs you about that we will say we don't know this is not something we've experienced so we're not trying to pretend that we know everything about sewing because we don't but anyways it's something new it was actually walter's idea so he's got a vested interest in this 
And uh, yeah, so the second episode will probably come out later this week. I haven't actually uh, figured out what day of the week we should do the um, videoing of this. It's not a live, although some way, someday down the road we might actually do a live episode of So Chatty. We'll see how it goes. Baby steps, you know, for something like this. And uh, so, you know, I have to figure out what day of the week is best for Walter so that we can do our next episode. But my goal is by the end of each week, there will be a new episode of So Chatty. So I hope you check it out. And as I said, if you've got suggestions for it, put them in the notes and uh, or send me an email. Okay, so that takes us to the end of today's vlog. And yeah, so I hope you have a good week. Um, I hope you have a good Easter and I hope you're very safe in what you have planned for Easter. And as always, we're not out of this thing yet. So stay happy, stay healthy, stay in as much as you possibly can. We'll see you next week. Bye bye for now.